Well, let's stand together, Acts chapter 5. And uh, I, I would ask you, if you have your notes, to just turn to the notes as well. And we're going to look at verse 32, Acts 5, 32. And tonight, I'd like to speak to you on a simple subject, and yet a very important subject, and it maybe ties in a little bit with Sunday night from the standpoint of just being faithful as we learned of the Apostle Paul and the end of his life being faithful. And you'll find that with all of the apostles who, as you probably know, died martyrs' deaths uh, in their faithfulness for the Lord. And uh, tonight we're going to learn from the lives of some of these apostles. In Acts chapter 5 and verse 32, the Bible study is simply entitled tonight, Never Give In. Never Give In. And so let's read beginning in verse 32 and down through verse number 42. The Bible says, And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. When they heard that, they were cut to the heart, speaking of the Sanhedrin, the religious ruling body, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. How many of you are glad that whenever you've been out soul winning, the people that you invited to church did not take counsel to kill you? But that's what's happening here, okay, just to put it in perspective. Verse 34, then stood there up one of the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had in reputation among all the people and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space. Amen. How many of you would say, yes, a little space of grace right now? That's what I need. And that's what Gamaliel was saying. Let, let's, let's hold off here for just a minute. Verse 35, and said unto them, ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what ye intend to do as touching these men. For before these days rose up uh, Theodos, who, boasting himself to be somebody to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves, who was slain, and all, as many as obeyed him, were scattered and brought to naught. After this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing, and drew away much people after him. He also perished, and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men, and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it. Lest haply ye be found even to fight against God. And to him they agreed. And when they had called the apostles, notice the next three words, please, and beaten them, let's say that together, and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus did you hear that? They commanded them that they should not speak in the name of Jesus. Isn't it amazing how tolerant the world is for every other name? Amen. Commanded them that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Now, if you want a modern day example of, of how we must be challenged to live in a culture that says, stop talking about Jesus, uh, we're going to learn from the example of the apostles tonight as we study this subject, never give in. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for the early church and the way it challenges us and the word of God and the way it instructs us. Help me as I give the Bible study tonight, Lord, to be a blessing. And may we have a heart to learn as my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Of course, you may be seated. Winston Churchill, whose life was a life filled with opportune moments for speeches, needed speeches, speeches challenging people to never quit, challenging people to be calm and carry on. Winston Churchill was a man who was known for his gift to challenge with a few short words. And on one occasion in 1941, he was giving a speech at the school he had attended as a boy. Harrow School in central London. And as Churchill rose to give the speech, all of the pupils were uh, interested and excited to hear from someone that had come up through their ranks. And Churchill stood before the young people, and these are the words he said. Never give in. Never, 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 in nothing great or small, large or petty, never give in, 
except to convictions of honor and good sense. Now, that's not the Holy Bible, but it's really good. And so I'm going to read it to you again. Never give in. Never, 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 in nothing, great or small, large or petty, never give in except to convictions of honor and good sense. Now this evening, we're going to look at the lives of some apostles who just would not give in. Some men who, though the culture was pressing against them, they determined that they would cease not to teach and to preach the Lord Jesus Christ. Now here in Acts 5, the Sanhedrin has become increasingly angry and jealous toward the apostles. They were once again threatening to put them to death. It's always amusing to me that the many times the major obstacle to the Lord Jesus and to the apostles in ministry were the religious leaders of the day. There was no doubt a jealousy. There was no doubt a heart to somehow get rid of these Jesus people. And we read about that just a moment ago. The Bible says in verse number 34 concerning this situation that as the Sanhedrin uh, had given their verdict or their, their desire to uh, take the lives of the apostles, that someone stood up. Someone stood up in the midst of the crowd. His name is Gamaliel. Some of you might recognize that name. The Apostle Paul, if you remember when he gave his testimony, said that he was schooled in the school of Gamaliel. It is believed that this is the same Gamaliel, very renowned as a Pharisee, obviously a man of some common sense, a man of reasoning, not necessarily a saved man, but a man that was very religious and a man that was given wisdom. And as he stands... He is not necessarily speaking in favor of Christianity, but he begins to speak on behalf of these apostles. And he reminds the Sanhedrin that there was once a man amongst them by the name of Theodos who uh, had risen up and was killed, no doubt, at the direction of the Sanhedrin. And by the way, never forget the power of the religious leaders, even as they influenced Pontius Pilate in the taking of our Lord Jesus Christ, the high priest Caiaphas and his role in that much like the medieval world where the Roman Catholic clerics would give commandment to the rulers and magistrates of Europe to take away those and to kill those who did not follow after Catholicism. In my studies of church history, and if you'll study it as well, you'll find it's difficult to see the written record of large groups of Uh, Bible believers who baptized after salvation from about the 4th century to maybe the 10th or 11th century, you just don't see a lot because so many people, whether it was the Waldensians or whether it was the Albigenses or whether it was some other group, uh, uh, the French Huguenots and others, they were literally murdered by the tens of thousands because they believed in salvation through Jesus Christ alone. You don't find a lot of a lot of history of them. And so it was in the early centuries that the Sadducees could somewhat uh, demand or uh, coerce uh, the punishment or even killings of those with whom they disagreed. And that practice seemed to be also evident in the Dark Ages as well. And this is what uh, here Gamaliel is saying. You know, there was this one Theotis, and we thought he was a troublemaker, and we, we had him killed. And the idea, the connotation of it is that maybe that wasn't so necessary after all. He reminds them of a similar person in verse 37 named Judas who had risen up to assert himself. Um, And we find this one here, Judas of Galilee, in the days of the taxing. Now maybe this was like, you know, in the Boston Harbor. I have no idea what was going on with uh, Judas at this particular moment, but he was against taxing apparently. And uh, and he began to speak out against that. And and again, uh, there was this punishment of this Judas and, and the driving out of his people. And so in this speech that Gamaliel gives, this call for reasoning, he somewhat appeases the Sanhedrin so that they would not kill the apostles. Now let me just say that some some, uh, new Christians may not understand this, but we ought to be thankful for any leader, religious or political leader, that would speak out on behalf of our religious liberty. Now there are people in some 
political places and sometimes religious places with whom we would not agree on various issues or whose personalities are somewhat repugnant to us. But whenever they would sign a law or whenever they would encourage our religious freedom, that would be something that we could give thanks for. Can I get an amen? I mean, we all understand that. And that's kind of what's happening here. It's not that Gamaliel was a born-again Bible-believing Baptist. It's not that he was uh, even a Christian. But he was a man in authority speaking a voice of reason and essentially was saving the lives of these apostles. Now, it's amazing to me that while they did not kill the apostles, still, the Bible says in verse 40, they beat the apostles. Isn't it amazing when people hate the name of Christ, the reactions that you'll see throughout history? And these early followers of Jesus Christ were beaten. It doesn't give the exact way. It may have been with whips or sticks, but they were beaten. I think it's so important, and I'm looking forward, I think, next week to having a dinner with a lot of the children of our church who read the book that I wrote last spring, Outsiders. I think it's so important that children and all of us remember the price that some of these people down through the ages have paid for our faith. I, I'm humbled to think uh, the, of the sufferings of so many of them just for believing in Jesus Christ. And here we see an early example of that. Now, they plainly saw that if the doctrine of Christ was preached, it must prevail. And so they were threatened by that. Uh, and by the way, the, they were not the first group of people. Uh, the Chinese government is threatened by religious freedom. And they do everything they can to suppress it. And it is amazing, uh, the artificial intelligence and all that's happening in China uh, to identify the faces of Christians, to document their whereabouts with cameras everywhere in that society. And in recent days, thousands of them have been arrested simply for their faith in Jesus Christ. You say, well, are you some kind of an alarmist? Do you think this kind of technology could be used against Christians in other places? I do believe that that could happen someday. And the fact of the matter is that uh, there are those who are threatened by someone who believes in the exclusive claim of Jesus or the need to preach the gospel or preach the whole counsel of God. And, and Gamaliel was touching on something when he said that if this is of God, you cannot overthrow it. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. <laughs> you know, if God's in it, he's going to develop it. It's going to happen. And Gamaliel, again, had, had great wisdom. Nevertheless, with all of his wisdom, his counterparts, the Sanhedrin, the ruling body of the religious leaders of, Jeru of, of Israel, they beat the apostles. So we have a little bit of a background tonight. We have... Uh, a band of fishermen who have become Jesus followers. They believe that Jesus is the very Son of God, the virgin-born Son of God. They believe that He alone can bring atonement for sin, and they are preaching this message. They are preaching everywhere they go that Jesus Christ has conquered death in the grave. And uh, people are beginning to turn to Jesus Christ, and apparently in large numbers. And the threats become more and more apparent on their lives. And they had already seen their Savior's life taken uh, by this same crowd, and now their own lives are being threatened. So what would they do? And what would you do? And what will we do when laws are passed or threats are made? What will we do? And I want you to see what the apostles did. Notice, first of all, the persistence of these apostles. In verse 41, the Bible says, and they departed from the presence of the council. What's the next word say? What's the next word say? verse 41. They departed from the presence of the council. Say it with me. Rejoicing. Rejoicing? I mean, can you imagine? Imagine James saying, that was awesome. You know, getting beat like that. I haven't gotten a beaten like that in a long time. Praise God. I, I just have to surmise that there might be many of us who'd say, yeah, they can do that to me once. I ain't doing that twice. I'm moving to Idaho and pitching a pup tent. I'm going to get as far away from these people as I can. I think some would have gone AWOL. I think some perhaps might have complained. But they were rejoicing that they were counted worthy of the sufferings of Jesus Christ. Now, the strength in their lives is seen in the rejoicing of their lips. 
The Bible says in James chapter 1 and verse 2, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. And I just want to remind you tonight because sometimes when we live for Jesus and when we witness for Jesus, the response of our friends or coworkers or neighbors is anything but, oh, yay, good for you. I remember leading a man to the Lord many years ago, and, and uh, he was uh, a cocaine addict, and uh, we started into this program of, of calling and accountability, and, and uh, I, I told him, I said, now, where you used to put that cocaine right, right in your pocket there, I want you to put a New Testament. And every time you have the urge, I want you to pull the Bible out. And, and a lot of times at lunch and such, he'd be reading his Bible. And one day he came to church, and I'm telling you, both eyes were black. His nose looked crooked. I mean, he was a mess. And I said, what happened? He said, well, some of my old friends got me after work because I wouldn't participate with them. His parents thought that he had gotten into some kind of a cult because he started going to church on Sunday night, of all things. In other words, instead of being so happy that he wasn't taking cocaine, they were threatened by the fact that he was living for God. And you might have some people like that. Rather than appreciating the fact that you live for Jesus, that you don't do drugs, you know, that you don't park your car on the lawn anymore, <laughs> that you don't cuss at them, whatever, you know, whatever the picture is of you know, just some out of control, unsaved guy. Instead of being thankful that you're the good neighbor and the Christian neighbor, sometimes they're threatened by what's going on in your life. And, and, and so... When those times come and when they say that under their breath name or whatever the case, the Bible says to count it all joy when those times come into our lives. Now, notice, first of all, they, they were persistent because of the filling of the Holy Spirit. We cannot stress this enough. Uh, it is my prayer uh, that someday, should the Lord tarry, and, and I'm buried over here at Joshua Memorial or wherever, wherever someone decides to put me, that our church family will remember that more than pastor tried to give us a list of rules and more than pastor tried to, uh, you know, teach us this preference and that, that he really tried to emphasize being filled with the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is going to produce holy fruit in our lives. And these men, Jesus had said to them in John 20, 22, receive ye the Holy Ghost. At the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost came down and indwelt every one of them that had been followers and believers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, the Bible says, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So these men were not too far removed from that moment. These men were possessors of and were possessed of the Holy Spirit of God. They were filled with the Spirit. And I submit to you, you cannot take a beating by the Sanhedrin and walk out of there going, awesome, dude, unless you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Or uh, unless you just, you know, had some kind of a mental problem. But I'm going to tell you something. These were men who were fully in their right mind, totally yielded to Jesus Christ, filled with the Spirit. And when they said, man, praise God that we could suffer, that was the evidence of the Holy Spirit of God in their life. Here were people who were totally, totally dependent upon the Lord. Notice, secondly, it is because of the fruit of the Spirit in their life. Look at Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Now, I don't know what you might be facing tonight. You say, oh, I'm, I'm not really facing any indignation for my Christian life. But if you consistently live for the Lord, you will. And that is why we must walk in the Spirit day by day. We must practice His presence because when it comes, when the name is said or when the difficulty comes, we can still count it joy that we're in the service of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 1, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Is that verse in your notes? 
Let's read that one together. 2 Timothy 2, 1. Ready? Begin. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now, why did Paul say that to Timothy? Because Paul knew that Timothy, as he uh, exerted leadership and as he encouraged people in the ways of God, that he was going to have to fight some tremendous battles and that he would have to be strong in the grace of God if he would be faithful in those battles. The grace of God is not some untouchable theological principle, but it is the reality of the presence of the Holy Spirit of God in our lives. One of the early uh, church leaders uh, in uh, about uh, 70 to maybe 100 or 120 AD was a man by the name of Polycarp. He was the bishop of Smyrna, a godly man. He was a man who knew the apostle John personally and uh, was well regarded amongst the early Christians for his love for Jesus. He was urged by the Roman proconsul to renounce Jesus Christ. And this was common uh, in many, many places of the Roman world. Uh, You would be told as a Christian to renounce Christ or face a penalty. And Polycarp said to the proconsul at Smyrna, Eighty and six years have I served him, and he never did me any injury. How can I blaspheme my king and my savior? The proconsul said, I have respect for your age. Simply say, away with the atheists, and you'll be set free. Polycarp said, he looked at the pagan crowd, and he looked at the proconsul, and he said, away with the atheists. They wanted him to look at the Christians and say, away with the atheists. He looked at the Roman guard and said, away with the atheists. For that he was taken to the stake. He was burned at the stake as he sang praise to the Lord Jesus Christ. What an amazing statement. He never did me any injury. How many of you would agree that the injury we face sometimes is of our own making, it's it's from Satan himself, but the Lord has never done us any injury. And, And so of the fruit of the Spirit, these men and women have suffered for the faith. And the, the apostles were not persistent in their own you know, dogged determination. It wasn't the power of positive thinking. It was the strength of the holy God, creator God, within them. And uh, as I was preaching this morning to the students, until Christ be formed in you, you know, when Christ is forming in you and when you're being transformed from the inside out, then you can give evidence of that with the fruit of your life as God is working. And so they were persistent. But notice, secondly, then, the preaching of the apostles. Now notice this. And daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. Now, I, I've, had a, I've had a really good day today. And uh, I started off my day, uh, of course, with the Lord earlier this morning. And then I went over to a little uh, restaurant over here with some of the men of our church. Some of, these, some of our guys are uh, you know, starting to retire and, and so forth. And, and, uh, and, and some of them before work get together, I guess, on, on Wednesday. So I went into the, to the restaurant over here by uh, Taco Bell. And uh, we, we, when I walked in, there was Brother Ron Campbell at the table. And about 10 or 15 of our men were in there. And uh, Brother Campbell, I think Brother Tanner said to me, Brother Campbell's going to bring our devotion now. By the way, thank God for men who will go to a public place and not be ashamed of Jesus. Amen. And it was awesome. There's about 50 people in there. I don't know if Brother, Brother Ron is he in here. He probably over disciple somebody. I told him afterwards, Brother Ron, you in here? Where are you? Raise your hand. I said, Brother Campbell, you need a radio show because he's got that radio voice, you know. And he, he began to read scripture about Jesus and he was talking to us about Jesus, and, and he was quoting scripture. He said, now I'm going to tell you my favorite verse. No one's in my class if they don't learn this favorite verse. There is none other name given under heaven, given among men, whereby ye must be saved. And all the other people around the uh, restaurant were kind of looking at him like this. And, and you could just tell nothing was going to stop Ron Campbell from giving that devotion. I don't care who would have walked over and said, sir, would you turn it down just a little bit? I think Brother Campbell would say, I can't hear you. My hearing aids aren't turned up right now. He would have had an excuse. He would have just kept going right on uh, preaching and teaching us about Jesus Christ. It was a blessing. And, uh, and you've been faithful this many years. Why stop? Right? Be faithful to the Lord. And so it says they ceased not to teach and preach. 
And what a wonderful motto. Sometimes I think that would be a good motto for an entire church. Our, our theme verse is Philippians 1.27, striving together for the faith of the gospel. I know of many churches, their theme verse is this. They cease not to teach and to preach Jesus. And I believe we learn from this that they, first of all, preached daily. Uh, this was not an occasional thing with them. The early church was all about Jesus all the time. They were just talking about the Lord. They cease not. It was continual. 1 Corinthians 1.18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. And so this is something that they, they shared daily. Now, you say, well, I just, I don't have the venue for that, and I, I have to be careful. And by the way, I've never been one to advocate soul winning, if you will, on the clock, right? Your employer deserves your 40 hours that you give to him. A lot of that 40 hours of witnessing is going to be because you're there early, because you have a good attitude, because you don't cuss, because you tell the boss, how can I help you here? But you do have your private time in the day. You have your lunch time. You have time before or after work. And sometimes the Lord, if we're looking, he'll let us talk to somebody about what he's done in our life or about uh, what we learned at church or about something that's been encouragement to us. And sometimes if you live that punctual and, and joyful life, people figure out that you're a Christian and it might be a little something on your desk. It might be a picture frame with Lancaster Baptist on it or God loves you. And by the way, you're, you're fine with that at work. And I, I've, uh, I've, been, I've been to the White House on occasion when there have been Democrats in office, Republicans in office, and I've walked through the offices and I've seen even in the White House uh, people who have religious uh, nomenclature, you know, things that they're on their desks and in their private space. I'm just saying, if you live for Jesus, people are going to see that in you, aren't they? And then they're going to have that tough time that comes suddenly. The diagnosis at the doctor or the problem with the teenager or whatever it is. And God's going to give you that opportunity. And, and I'm just saying, those opportunities come more frequently to people that are looking for them and asking for them. And, and, and the, the apostles were looking all the time. They ceased not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. They, they preached, secondly, determinately. They were determined to preach the gospel. Nothing was going to cause them to cease and desist. This reminds me of the apostle Paul in Acts 20, 21. It says, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Now on Sunday, I reminded the church family that our organized soul winning times are Thursday mornings, Thursday evenings at 630 and Saturday mornings at 930. And it's good to have times that are set aside because what gets scheduled gets done. And sometimes we need a schedule like that and we need to hear a little lesson and maybe if we, we're not sure who we can go with just to get someone to go with. And I, I, this, this church uh, should always have, as long as I'm pastor, we're always gonna have organized soul winning times because it just helps us and reminds us. But I'm just so convicted about this fact and and I was thinking of it all summer long because uh, the Lord allowed me some wonderful soul winning opportunities and opportunities to spread the gospel just in the course of daily life. And I was reminded, you know, I don't want our church to think that our witness is relegated to Thursday. I want us to cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. We ought to look at everyone as a candidate for soul winning. And in whatever activity you're in, um, I was talking to uh, John and Christine the other day, my son-in-law and daughter, and, and uh, they, John, John just loves athletics. He grew up on the mission field, and he watched sports all the time because he missed America. And he knows so many things about sports and their names and their positions and all these things, their records, how many home runs, how many, how many points, and he loves sports. And so they, they put our granddaughter, Delaney, in uh, soccer. And I don't know, I guess probably over here at the soccer field, and I said, no, no. I said, whoa, 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 you did what? I said, uh, you, you put her over there with the heathen? My granddaughter? You know, and I was kind of questioning them. What are you putting her into? And, and all this type of thing. And I said, well, if you're going to put her over there, then, then uh, hopefully that'll be a place for her light to shine for Jesus. And Christine said, we already, already have one of the teammates that's come to church once already. You know, that was a blessing to me. Because uh, we ought to see every relationship as a relationship with which we can tell others about Jesus Christ. So important. 
And so they preached determinately. Uh, they, they held nothing back. Paul said, I kept back nothing that was profitable to you. I always love the story of a young lady that, uh, that came to church and, and uh, she had lived next to the church for some time, uh, but had never gone to the church. She'd grown up next to the church. No one had ever invited her. Finally, for some reason, she went to the church and she heard the gospel and she heard that Jesus died for her sin and her sin could be forgiven. She could have a home in heaven. And when they gave the opportunity to be saved, the young lady said to the lady that invited her to be saved, she said, you know, I, I don't think you people really believe this. I don't think I can believe it. She said, if you really believe that I have been on my way to hell all this time, you've believed that, and that Jesus is the only way to get saved, if you really believe this is the good news, and you have never one time in 20-some years tried to tell me about this good news, I don't think you really believe it. Can I tell you that some of your friends at work are more surprised that you don't talk to them about it than they would be if you talked to them about it? Paul said, I'm not going to hold anything back that's profitable for you. How many of you believe it's profitable for everyone to know Jesus Christ is their Savior? They, they preached uh, continually. Notice not only their persistence in their preaching, but let's notice finally their perspective on the ministry. Just, just in these two words, I'll share this with you and we'll be done. Notice in verse 42 it says, and daily in the temple and in every house they ceased not, notice the two words here, to teach and preach. To teach and preach. The first thing I want you to learn from this is that they alternated their approach. Uh, sometimes their mode was more uh, what is stated in the Greek, didaskalos, it's sort of a line upon line precept, sharing, teaching. I was at a school the other day and they were showing me the classroom and they said, uh, we don't use the lecture model here, we use more of a Socratic model here, meaning more of a one-on-one -on -one teaching and mentoring style, teaching. And then it said they preach, k -ruk. Sometimes it was with more of a loud declaration. They would stand up in a public place or perhaps in the temple, and they would declare those truths. And, and I, I would say that while uh, many of you would be uncomfortable doing that, uh, that you should be ready. The Bible says we should be ready always to give an answer to any man that asketh the reason of the hope that is within us. Many of the men of our church have stood up at the funeral services of their own relatives and have either preached the funeral, many of you, or given a eulogy of some type that included the gospel plan of salvation. We should be ready for that. I just saw today in the news, I forget, his, I think his, is the coach's name back there at uh, Clemson, is it Dabo Sweeney? Is that his name? And I just saw today where um, he was being interviewed about the season, and he said to the press, this is a paraphrase, but hopefully fairly close. He said, I know my purpose in life. My purpose in life is to glorify God and to love my family and to help young people reach their potential in this life. Now, there was his moment, and he didn't, didn't bother to hesitate at all. He said, that's my purpose in life. He had a moment to glorify God, and he took it. Some of you are going to get awards at work. Some of you are going to get a promotion. Some of you are going to have opportunity come your way. I'm just saying, use that opportunity. It might be an opportunity to teach someone. It might be someone that comes to you, a younger person at work, and says, could you help me with something? And, and uh, somewhere in that conversation, you can just say, you know, I, just, I try to pray to the Lord to give me wisdom every day for these things. Or I'll tell you what, I've learned a lot of these principles right at my own church. You'd be amazed how much the Bible has to say about interpersonal relationships, how much the Bible has to say about order, and, 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 and if we just have that opportunity just to teach someone, because let me tell you something, every one of us tonight have influence. Every one of us have it. You have it in your home, you have it in your workplace, in your neighborhood, and God gives us those opportunities so that we can teach and preach, and so they alternated. Now, turn if you would, or look at your notes there at Jude 23, because this is a great example of what I mean by alternating your approach. Jude 22 says, and of some have compassion, making a difference. Of some have compassion. In other words, Jude was written to confront false teachers and 
and false teachings. And, and, and the Bible says that with some of those, you can deal with them in a teaching mode, a compassionate mode. Come, let us reason together. Let's talk about this. Sometimes an intellectual mode, perhaps, an apologetic mode, and maybe giving them scientific evidences for uh, whatever. But, but come, let's, let's talk. Let's, let's compassionately deal with this case. But notice what else it says. And others save with fear. I mean, there are, there are times when we just need to let it be known. Hey, look at you're not rejecting me. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. All I'm trying to do is help you get ready for that day when you're going to meet God. You don't even have to be mean when you say that, but you're putting something in their heart that perhaps the Holy Spirit will use later in their life. I remember out soul winning when I was first, in my first few years here, and I, I, um, I was out soul winning and uh, was uh, on this doorstep, and I was down on about the third step and looking up at this guy, and he came and I mean, he was rough. He had a Levi vest on and big old hairy chest, you know, and all kinds of tattoos and just a rough, big old kind of a biker looking guy. And, and he's like, what do you want? And I said, well, my name is Paul Chapel. I'm the pastor over here at Lancaster Baptist Church. I'm just out talking to people about Jesus. And I forget all what all I said. And he started cussing at me. I mean, he was doing everything he could to intimidate me. How many of you know somebody you work with, they are so impressively intelligent that they cannot express themselves without a curse word every other word. It's like a gift to them, you know. <laughs> he was pulling one of those on me. And I remember I was three steps down. I remember walking up two steps and saying, look, the Bible says that one day you're going to spend eternity in heaven or hell. And I'm out here trying to help you know how that you can spend eternity in heaven. And, uh, and he backed off. And he, uh, he began to calm down. He wasn't saved at that day, but uh, I had opportunity to share the gospel with him. Now, I'm not, ad I'm not advocating that you ladies try that approach, all right? I'm really not, but, <laughs> but I'm just saying some people need to hear it. Some of you might remember a man years ago in our church uh, named Mike Eads. He's, he's in heaven now. Remember knocking on Mike's door. He was, he was just, he was a backslidden fella. He had been saved as a child got kicked out of the army in Korea, rough as a cob. And, and I remember just, again, door, door knocking. And, and a lot of times the reason people are meet is because they're under conviction. And I knocked on his door and said, ah, I used, I used to go to church. I used to be just like you. <laughs> Giving me a hard time, threw out a few choice words. And I said, it's not about being just like me, sir. It's about following Jesus. If you ever were truly saved, you might want to consider getting back into church and following Lord Jesus Christ. And that next Sunday, there he was, he and his wife. He was our sound man for many years in the church. And I'm just saying there are some people that if, you, if I would have said to him, oh, you used to go and it didn't work out well, you know, teach his own. Okay, see you later. That's not what Mike Eads needed to hear. He needed to know the truth. And, and, and I don't know how to express it for you, but I will say this, the Spirit will give you wisdom. Can I say that we have many teachers in this church? There's probably a dozen public school teachers here tonight. You can't treat every student the exact same way. There are some students that are going to just need a little more audible from you and eyeball to eyeball with you. There are some students that need to be told, Johnny, you do that one more time. And uh, we're going to go to the principal's office or, you know, whatever the case might be. Like the old Bill Cosby line, I brought you into this world, I can take you out. Don't say that to your students, but <laughs> you know what I'm saying. There are some students that need to know. We're not going to put up with that. There's other students that they, they might need to, to write something or to write it with you on the board. I don't know, but it seems like every child maybe needs something just a little bit different. And in soul winning, we need to pray, Lord, help me to know if I'm supposed to teach or be a little more bold. Help me to know if I should start by just giving a tract or if I should share my testimony first or maybe, is it, maybe if I should 
have lunch with this person or maybe we should invite them over to the house or invite them to the church. Lord, would you help me? Because even the apostles, sometimes they taught, sometimes they preached. But the key is this. They were always talking about Jesus Christ. Whether it was loud or soft, it was always the same thing. That's why I love the song we heard just a moment ago because it was so Christ-centered. Now, there's a church in Scotland pastored by a man named Horatius Bonar, who has written several hymns in our songbook. And over the, over the church, they put an interesting verse. I don't know that it would seem relevant to us today necessarily. All of God's word is relevant, but just from the standpoint of on the whole front of the church, they put, of all things, he, uh, Proverbs 11.30, he that winneth souls is wise, and they put it in Hebrew. Now, if I came to the deacons at the next deacons meeting and said, God's put something on my heart, fellas, and I just think we need to put, you know, Proverbs 11.30 in Hebrew right on the side of the church, I mean, they'd probably go, well, I mean, he's done a pretty good job so far, but what in the world? <laughs> you know, they'd probably say, yeah, pastor, we'll help you nail that baby up there, but what in the world? <laughs> you know, uh, putting some verse in Hebrew, because most of the people in this auditorium tonight don't read Hebrew. I think Brother Luis Montano was in here a moment ago. He might be over at the Spanish now. But uh, when, when we had his ordination, he answered questions in English, Spanish, Greek, and Hebrew. It was quite interesting and amazing. But most of us cannot do that. And yet, this pastor said, I want to put the Hebrew there. It was put there as an indication to show the object of the church existence was to win souls, and also in hope that some Jews passing by would come to worship the God of Abraham. By the way, the state of California Department of Education currently is trying to submit curriculum that not only speaks ill of the police, but also refers to Israel as a terror state. It's amazing to me the anti-Semitism that's on the rise in the world today. And God has commanded us to love Israel, to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And Horatio Bonar knew that, and his prayer was that Jewish people would come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. By the way, we ought to pray that everybody gets saved. So they put this Hebrew verse up there. Dr. Bonar preached from these words on the day that the church put the sign up. And he explained to the church that the word winning was the word used to describe how someone might stalk for game, how someone might work hard to, to find or to win something. And, and he said uh, that this matter of soul winning indicated that we must be very wise in the way that we go about our witnessing. He said how carefully David prepared to meet Goliath, taking five smooth stones out of the brook. He did not assume that one would be lying by his hand when he needed it, uh, he wanted to be ready to do the work of the Lord. And, and he that winneth souls is wise. And as we walk in the Spirit, we are going to talk about Jesus, and God will give us wisdom with what to say and how to say it. And I believe this, that when we enter into a new job or a new class or when God gives us new relationships, that it shouldn't be weeks and weeks before they know that we believe that Jesus Christ is Savior that it should be quite soon in a relationship that that is simply told. So they alternated their approach, and then finally, they appreciated the word. The Bible says they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. You see, in 1 Peter 4.13, it says, Rejoice in as much as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Now, may it be said of us tonight, they ceased not. May it be said of the longtime Lancaster residents of this church, they ceased not. Every Easter they came, every Christmas they came, during the year they came. They were on the radio, they were on the billboards, they were everywhere, always. They ceased not. Let's say that together. They ceased not. If the worst thing someone can say about you is, that lady is always trying to tell me about Jesus that's not too bad. They ceased not. And you never know what fruit you might see. You never know how your witness might be the seed and someone else harvests. You never know that someone out 
somewhere else is praying for the very person that you're talking to. You never know that there might be some young man come out for the military, some young lady come out to work in aerospace. There's a lot of that going on right now. And here's this 20-something just out of college. And maybe away from the Lord or maybe not saved, but someone back home is praying, God, I didn't want him to go to California. God, I don't even know if there are Christians in California. That's how they pray, by the way. I mean, they think that, they think that our ushers all have orange hair and, you know, and, People really sometimes think that. And, and, and there's probably somebody saying, God, would you help her while she's there to somehow hear the gospel? You might be some mother's answer to prayer. So they cease not. Or in the paraphrase of Winston Churchill, never, never, never give in. You say, do you think the day could come where maybe... We're told that we can't say this or to stop saying that. I I don't know. It very well could. And that's why we come back to the blueprint and we say, Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. I often think about my ordination. I have my ordination certificate on my office wall. If you ever want to come up and look at it, you're welcome to. And, uh, you know, the ordination is kind of a somber time in a man's life because you're being set apart for the ministry. And normally the message is given and the message is pretty strong. I mean, Never, t- never turn back. This, the fruits and the calling are without repentance. And be faithful. And that's exactly what I should have heard and what I want to be. But I think about so many of those men, both full-time pastors and deacons, who signed my ordination certificate, who are not even in church today, who haven't witnessed for Jesus perhaps in years, And they were the ones telling me to be faithful and signing the bottom line. And I don't speak in judgment of them. I'm just saying it's it's one thing to say it. It's another thing to live it. And I'm so thankful that you're here tonight, and I sure love our church family. But we need to exhort one another, the Bible says in Hebrews, and so much the more as we see the day approaching. Let's continue to be faithful for God. Hey, One of these days, the weather's going to cool down. It might be December, but it will cool down. (laughs) The fall season's coming. I want to sing that a song we used to sing a long time ago. Sherry, maybe you can find it. It's harvest time. Remember that song? It's harvest time. I like that song. Harvest time. And we used to sing that song. Why? To remind ourselves that even as the farmers are out here bringing in the harvest, we need to be bringing in the harvest as well. They ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. And I don't know. I mean, I talked to, I talked to a lady today at El Pollo Loco, and uh, uh, just standing there, and, and I was inviting her to church, and she said, oh, I've been invited so many times. I said, amen to that. That's a blessing. I said, but now you've got to come. You've got to come and hear the, hear the message. I said, I'm the pastor. I want you to come. And I'm just saying, someone might have said something to someone else that you talked to, and now you're the next one. How many of you know sometimes it takes two or three times for some people to get it? So let's cease not in our faithfulness to the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And may God help us to be faithful. And may the history of our church be written, and may it say, they ceased not. They just kept on preaching. And all of God's people said...